Yatse, Shandin Tom Dash Jene, Hush Klishni Dene at Nishle, Seslichi Daz Kane, Da Nasha. Hello, and it looks like everyone's shining bright on this beautiful afternoon. What I just said in Navajo, or Diné as we like to say, is Shundin Tom is what they call me. I am Mud Clan from my mother, I come from Red Valley, and I currently reside in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, I was asked to give a brief history of my history here with Sundance. Back in 2016, I was invited to be a full circle youth fellow through the indigenous program. And from there, I had a stint as an intern and applied uh, to the Native Lab program where I had uh, my short film, Mud Hush Klishni, workshopped. And after, I premiered it here at the 2018 Sundance Film Festival in the US Narrative Shorts program. Um, I'm currently developing a feature with the help of the indigenous program here at the Institute. And they support it, projects from indigenous artists all around the world. And just so you know, there are actually five indigenous films showing here at this year's festival. And I invite you to watch every one of them and bask in the indigenous perspective. All right, now I'm done plugging. The real reason I'm here is to begin this convergence of the celebration of women here at Sundance by recognizing the Ute tribe. We would like to acknowledge them as the past, present, and future caretakers of the traditional land we are on today. We pay our respects and thank them for allowing us to be here. It's so lovely here to be kicking off the celebration of women, or atsa, as we say in Navajo. I hope you enjoy the wise words about to be spoken and have an inspiring time here at the festival. Ahyehe. Thank you so much, Shandine. I'm Carrie Putnam. I'm the executive director of Sundance Institute. And I'm Pat Mitchell, chair of the board. And we welcome you to the 2020 Women at Sundance celebration. I have to say, I really love seeing that video. Um, I first came to Sundance in 1992. I was dating myself a little there. Um, and I got a chance to meet Allison Anders, Jenny Livingston, Mira Nair, Leslie Harris, and so many other women um, of those early 90s days who were blazing a new path and telling incredibly powerful, groundbreaking stories at a time back then when a community like this didn't exist at all. So it is really moving to me to be here in the room with this group and all of you. Those women had visions, but they were often denied the opportunity that was offered to their male peers. But still, they refused to be shut out. Instead, they kept creating, kept pushing, kept pushing the envelope, I should say, and kept breaking barriers. These fierce, independent women filmmakers inspired others, and as time went by, they grew from singular artists into a small community. And yes, it took far too long, but eventually that community grew. And now, all of you in front of us today artists, industry, stakeholders, and philanthropists, this community is a totally unstoppable force. <laughs> yes, much has changed since my first festival in 1994. And one thing we certainly have seen is how this event has grown, becoming one of the most highly anticipated events during the festival. And as it's grown, we've had to move venues year to year. And this one, believe it or not, was a bowling alley until opening night of the festival. <laughs> so I want a shout out to the extraordinary Sundance events team for the transformation. <laughs> But one of the reasons that we all want to be in this room is that in this room is the collective vision and power of women who know how to optimize both, their power and their vision, to tell our stories, to speak our truth. And I want to take a moment now to recognize all of the women filmmakers in the room, from short films to features to series and new media, 44% of the work in this year's festival was directed by women. <laughs> of our 
66 competition films, 48% are directed by one or more women, and of these directors, 35% are women of color. Good numbers, progress, but we're not where we need to be. But right now, look around you and stand up if you're a filmmaker in this room. Stand up and accept our applause. Yes, take a moment, look at each other. This is our community. This is our power. This is our movement. Uh, at Sundance, I think, I think um, obviously we're here, you know that we're committed to broadening the aperture on who gets to tell stories um, and who gets to receive them. One way we're doing just that is through Reframe. This is an industry-wide effort that we lead with women in film in Los Angeles um, in partnership with Women in Film in Los Angeles. And we're really proud of the impact of this program. Uh, one, of the, one of the aspects of it is the Reframe Stamp. And I want to encourage anybody who doesn't know about the Reframe Stamp, if you're a producer, an executive, a filmmaker, apply for the stamp on your productions. It signals a gender-balanced production. You can get it, audiences can see it, um, and hopefully it'll be a building thing. It's already really beginning to take, to take root. Um, another aspect of Reframe is a program called Reframe Rise, a two-year sponsorship program for eight women directors who are poised to lead bigger budgeted features, TV pilots, and their own shows. We have three of the Reframe Rise um, fellows here at the festival, and I just want to um, recognize them. Patricia Cardoso, Haifa Al-Mansour, and Hanel Culpepper. And then at, at Sundance Institute, we, you, many of you know we've long had a Women at Sundance Fellowship, but last year we evolved this fellowship to become the Momentum Fellowship, which now invests in an in intersectional cohort of artists identifying as women, non-binary or transgender, artists of color, artists with disabilities, um, that, that entire cohort makes up the Momentum Fellows. Um, they're supported in their work and careers to take them to the next level with a year of mentorship and highly customized support. Um, will this year's fellows, Momentum Fellows, please stand? Huge, if they're here, I hope they are. Huge congratulations to Penny Lane, Malika Zuhali Warhol, Christina Cho, Deb Eskenazi, Linda Yvette Chavez, Abril Speaks, Andrew Ahn, and Rodney Evans. You guys are amazing. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, along with vision, values, passion, and persistence, we have others to recognize <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> who have all those things and more. Exactly. I just wanted to add one more thing about the Momentum Fellows. There's another piece of it we want to thank. Can I, can I hit that? Please do. Okay, thank you, Pat. Um, <laughs> Uh, because we don't usually do this together, we don't do have this you noticed? Act. We're doing it now. <laughs> um, each of those Momentum Fellows are going to be supported with, um, with professional coaches, um, supported by the Harness Foundation. It's a really important part of that pro pro program. Um, so I want to take a moment to thank those master coaches who donate their services and their years of experience to help our fellows all year long. Um, Naomi Banks, Karen Kernow, Carolyn Keyes, Margaret Krigbaum, Heather Neely, Jay Perry, Stephanie Rosal, and Val Williams. And a special thanks to Renee Friedman, the mastermind behind matching each fellow with the perfect coach. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Is, I just got so excited I was moving right, right on. on yes. <laughs> but we do know that along with the vision, the values, the passion, the persistence that is behind every one of the filmmakers and fellows in this room, we also need money and the mentoring. And Sundance Institute is providing and trying to provide the access for both. And on the slide behind me now, you'll see the list of wonderful companies, individuals, foundations who support women at Sundance. 
I want to especially thank Zions Bank for their generous support and a call out to Adobe for their incredible commitment to women's storytellers. And of course, we want to express a huge thank you to Refinery29 and Luna for hosting and presenting this event. And this is an opportunity where Carrie and I get to say thanks to a very special group of women, the women of the Sundance Leadership Council. They help us shape and grow this program because they're tireless advocates, they're very generous supporters, and they are our thought partners. Please give these amazing women a rousing round of applause. Final, final and special thank you to Ruth Ann Harnish, um, who, is, who is created the amazing, the amazing Harnish coaching program, helped us launch our Women at Sundance financing and strategy intensive, as well as Sundance Catalyst for Women. Ruth Ann has supported our work not just through her philanthropy, but through her insights, activism, and generosity of spirit. Um, can't thank you enough, Ruth Ann, for all you do. And, and, and um, I also want to take a moment to thank Alana Hauser, who is the director of the Women at Sundance program. Where's Alana? Right over there. She's the one running around with a headset, put this whole event together and the whole program all year long. Thanks, Alana. Um, I love that a theme of this year's festival is Imagine Futures. We all know films can introduce new vocabularies, new ways of thinking about the past and uncovering the truth. I like to imagine a future with women at the helm, um, shaping a new narrative of our world. So that's what I want to leave for us today. And I'll do, I'm going to turn it over to Pat from here. So thank you all. Before Carrie leaves, please join me in recognizing that all of the strategies, the priorities, all of the vision and values that have led us to this day begin with our leader, Carrie Putnam. And Carrie and I recognize that we stand here along with so many other people in this room, and it's a great privilege to speak on their behalf and on behalf of the trustees who join me in the year-long support of the Institute and its programs. When I ask myself if about what I imagine the future to be, I do imagine it where there are women, as there are in this room, shaping the new narrative about power and how we collectively embrace it, use it, and share it. This year I wrote a book called Becoming a Dangerous Woman. <laughs> Embracing risk to change the world. It's really a collective narrative about why these dangerous times call for all of us to be braver, bolder, to take more risk, to be more fearless, to break the silences, and especially to show up for one another as you have done today. I had the privilege in writing this book to talk with trailblazers like Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined intersectionality and gave us a new foundation. I'd like to say that Kimberly gave us the new foundation for the fourth wave of feminism. Thank you, Kim. I also talked with Ava DuVernay, whose work ensures that the communities of color are getting their art made and seen. Thank you, Ava. And among the other dangerous women I talked to was the great Ruth Ann Harnish, who said, among other provocative ideas, what can be more dangerous than justice if you've been on the wrong side of it? Our program this year features women who I most definitely call dangerous because they are on the right side of justice. They're breaking silences, exposing corruption, 
telling the stories, celebrating the stories that might have been untold without their vision and their passion and talent, of course. Our first guest is known to some as Rada Ms. Prime. <laughs> known to many, actually, as her hip-hop comedy has sold out shows from New York to Norway. And this year, she landed in Park City. For her directorial debut, please welcome writer, director, and star of the 40-year-old version, Rada Blank. Yo, where my period at? <laughs> oh shit, there it go. Right next to belly bloating and this spotty flow. Yo, where my damn house keys? Why my lower legs hurt? Side Attica lock legs like Attica word. Yo, why my ass always horny? <laughs> why I always gotta pee? Why the young boy on the bus offer his seat to me? Why my skin so dry? <laughs> Why am I yawning right now? Why them AARP suckers sending shit to my house? Why my ass so impatient, but I like them young bucks, but 10 o'clock roll around and I'm too tired to fuck. Why my knees be writing checks that my back can't cash? Why I think I'm going fart, but my ass got other plans. Why most hip hop got me feeling so much older, yo. When the fuck this loudest song going be over? Yeah, I tried to dance hard, but my knees straight caught me. Cause yo, this is 40 suckers. This is 40. <laughs> I'm sorry, the altitude is really fucking with my memory. <laughs> Yo, where my period at? Just wanted to see that in sign language, really. <laughs> Just, that's really special. This moment is brought to you by Tampax. Um, so that little rhyme that I did, is how I generally open a show when I'm performing as Rodimus Prime, the 40-year-old version. Um, it's a cabaret act that I've done for a couple of years. But it's also a pivotal moment in my movie, The 40-Year-Old Version, where my character, a down-on-her-luck playwright from New York, <laughs> decides to reinvent herself, to salvage her voice the only way she knows how, and that's to go back to her first love, hip-hop. Now. <laughs> My character, often uh, in the film, is vacillating between two artistic institutions, theater and hip hop, two different boroughs, Brooklyn and New York, uh, Manhattan, and two different parts of herself, her heart and her mind, right? So her heart tells her, maybe this hip hop thing, you know, is the way to go. And her mind tells her, not at 40, bitch. But if I'm being completely honest, hip hop for me has been a meditation, right? No, I don't think I'm gonna go out and sell a million records, but it is my therapy. It's how I got over losing my mother, who's my best friend. We share a birthday together. Uh, we're like the black Sophia Petrillo and Dorothy Spornak. We were golden girls. So hip hop had gotten me through that, and it also got me through you know, this idea that like a woman of a certain age and a certain size can't get with a young tenderoni. <laughs> you 25, I am not. You very, very young, I got two age spots. But you got a crotch and I got a crotch. 
and you the one with stamina for giving back shots. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> but hip hop and taking on my persona of Rodimus Prime gave me permission to celebrate fat girl sex with a fat girl sex anthem. How about that? It also gave me a place to address some of the tension I experienced as a writer uh, being maybe one of two women in a room full of men. Nothing against you guys, okay? But I got to address it in a song I call, If I Had a Dick. <laughs> and the chorus is very simple. It comes from being in a room where I'm hired to speak, but often feeling like I don't really have permission to. And I remember performing this at Joe's Pub and some of my brothers from the room showed up and I got to address them personally. <laughs> Yo, stop interrupting me, trick, and stop talking over me, bitch. Yo, stop acting like you the shit just because your ass got a dick. <laughs> they had no idea I was talking about them. <laughs> uh, hey, Rod, I love that If I Had a Dick song. Um, <laughs> But hip hop music has been a, a balm at times. And just like my character, I love the music. The music and culture hasn't always loved me. And at this particular age, it really doesn't know how to confront someone who still loves the culture, in spite of what the culture tells me is relevant. I should look a certain way, right? I should sell a certain thing, right? I should be a certain size. Well, me being Radimus Prime is about defying that. And how I hope to defy that in the future is just being a symbol that you don't age out of your passion. Now, mind you, I had to make the 40-year-old version now because I can't fucking play 39 forever. I do moisturize, but <laughs> I hope that in the future, when a filmmaker comes to a producer or a financier and says, yes, at this age and this size, I want to be the star of my own movie. Yes, uh, I plan on directing it. Yes, I plan on hiring predominantly queer folks, people of color, women, people who are in the margins to be it, working on my film. So that's my vision. And I hope that the film inspires the next generation of filmmakers who've always heard no to say yes to themselves. Thank you. Hey, Rada, I've got an idea for you. How about your next show is called the 77-year-old version? <laughs> So this year's festival lineup of documentaries includes uh, Giving Voice, and this is the high stakes August Wilson monologue competition. It's a documentary about that competition, which as many of you may know, high schoolers from all over the country vie for this opportunity to appear on Broadway. Now a sophomore at NYU, Callie Holly shares her competition monologue this, she plays the strong-willed Bernice from August Wilson's The Piano Lesson. Callie. Avery, I ain't ready to get married right now. I ain't said nothing about closing up. I got a lot of woman left in me. I got enough on my hands with Maritha. I got enough people to love and take care of. You trying to tell me a woman can't be nothing without a man. But you all right, huh? You can just walk out of here without me, without a woman. And you can still be a man. That's all right. Ain't nobody going to ask you, Avery, who you got to love you? That's all right for you. But everybody's going to be worried about Bernice. How Bernice gonna take care of herself? How she gonna raise that child without a man? Wonder, 
What's she do with herself? How's she gonna live like that? Everybody got all kinds of questions for Bernice. Everybody always telling me that I can't be a woman unless I got a man. Well, you tell me, Avery, you know. How much woman am I? Avery, I told you, I just ain't ready to get married right now. Thank you. <laughs> see you on Broadway, Kelly, I'm sure of that. So all of the artists who you see on the stage and whose stories you see on screen, they all need the support of visionary leaders at the companies, companies like Refinery29 who recognize the power of women's stories. Please join me in welcoming the Global President and Chief Content Officer, Amy Emmerich. <laughs> Whose idea was it for me to come up after those two women? Thanks so much. Um, it's always amazing to be here, and I wish you could all see just all of your smiling faces and the support is palpable, so amazing. Um, the event's already been a killer, we're not even halfway through, so hang on. Um, Sundance team, Kerry, Pat, Mary, just everybody, you take such care to make sure that we are all going to have a good time at this event, and I just wanna, for all of us here, say thank you because we can feel it. Um, Refinery29, we are so proud to be back here with the women of Sundance for the fifth consecutive year and to have Luna Bar as our partner for this. Um, you guys should get to know Luna Bar. For more than two decades, they have been committed to championing women's equality. Kit Crawford, if you don't know her, you should. She's the co-CEO of Cliff Bar. Whether it's partnering with the US Women's National Team, those gals, you know, they won the World Cup, um, or through the programs like Luna Fest. Luna and Kit and her team are consistently making women a priority, and they have for 20 years. And I just wanna say that is something to celebrate. And this was called the Women's Celebration, and they deserve that shout out. Um, this year's Sundance has already got a ton of memorable things, and I just needed to run down a few. The park, the truck that is parked on Main Street with the sign, Listen to Black Women. Has everybody seen that? It is amazing. From the multiple standing ovations for the brave women of On the Record. Come on. The Latinx house and the activist, Monica Ramirez, right? Who has manifested that. To Eva Longoria, who I got to see there, talk about she's gonna be, you know, direct two features. I mean, these things are worth celebrating. The people of Planned Parenthood on the mountain talking about fighting for all of our rights, making sure we are aware of what's going on. And then, of course, of course, there's the films, you know, just the films. Um, if I could stand here and name them all, I would. Um, and I think you guys already said 44%. That is worth saying twice. We know we've got room to grow, but that is unbelievable. And the Glorias, and the Nets, the Hillary. I mean, can I just get a show of hands? If you had to stand on this stage, not just after those two women, but the ones to come, would you be intimidated? Yeah, it's fun to be me right now. Okay, so I didn't sleep last night. Um, just thinking about this moment, and then when I tried to figure out like what's making me so shaky, I realized it's conditioning. You know, women by and large, we have been conditioned over centuries to believe that we do not belong or deserve to be on a stage, to be in the company of real power. Yet, what's so great about Hillary and Gloria is they believe all women deserve their place on a stage, not just here at Sundance, but in our own communities. They've been fighting for our space on this and every stage their entire lives, and we are all better because of it. It's worth saying. And yes, we need the Glorias and the Hillarys, but we also need to see ourselves as part of that fabric. In this gathering, it is about inspiring all of us to keep showing up to keep speaking up, to keep sharing our stories, because that's what's gonna make that grand stage just a little bit bigger for women of all kinds. So, what's your vision of your future? I'm sorry, that terrifies me. That question is terrifying for many, many people, but we've gotta get comfortable answering it. 
because that's the only way to manifest it. And I got here five years ago, Shannon Gibson and I, we asked ourselves that question, and that's when we came here to announce Shatterbox Film Program on the mountain. And little did we know that that would birth an entertainment brand, Refinery29, that just is not a business to us, it's a movement. And, and I thank you for having us here, because you power it for us. And before you leave here today, I'm gonna give you a little homework. I should have been a teacher, I like teachers. Um, I want you to ask women here today, or ask someone you don't know, or even better, ask someone who doesn't look like you what their vision is of their future. You don't have to do more than that. You don't have to help, you just gotta listen. You gotta see them. You gotta create a true safe space for them to manifest that dream and their power. Because the future is not gonna be perfect, but can be just and it can be kind. And more importantly, I believe in the future that we will all make together. So thank you for having me. Have a great Sundance. I connected with our next speaker. She walked up to me and she said, hi, I'm a computer scientist and a digital activist. And I recognized her right away as the woman who is turning the AI world upside down with her demands that it be transparent, accountable, and that it, in doing so, she's calling out the racial and the gender biases ingrained in artificial intelligence. Please welcome the amazing Joy Boloini. Thank you. So I am a poet of code. I'm telling stories that make daughters of diaspora's dream and sons of privilege pause. Um, <laughs> I'm also the founder of the Algorithmic Justice League, where we use art and research to illuminate the social implications of artificial intelligence. And we're on a mission to fight something I call the coded gaze. Now, how many in the room have heard of the male gaze? The white gaze, the post-colonial gaze. Okay, to that lexicon, we add the coded gaze, which like the male gaze, like, which like the uh, white gaze is a reflection of those who have the power and the privilege to shape the priorities of technology. And I was first introduced to the coded gaze when I was working on a project that used face detection. And in the video that should be queued up, you'll see what my experience was with trying to actually use a computer vision system. So please cue that, Phil. What about my face? Okay, so what you just saw there oh, was what that. Fanon already said, oh, right? Black skin, white mask. Literally putting on a white mask to have my face be detected is when I started asking, are machines really neutral? And what you see is not so much. So then I posed this question around the women of Wakanda, right? I wanted to see how computer vision read their faces. And I had something in common with them besides being highly melanated, arc android, orchestrated. <laughs> what we saw was that some of their faces weren't detected, some were labeled male, and you see the red column? That's the age classification. Black don't crack, algorithmically <laughs> verified. <laughs> started to say, what about iconic women beyond the fictional space, in beyond our imagined areas? And what I found led to this poem called AI Ain't I a Woman, where I post Sojourner Truth's 19th century question to 21st century algorithms. And here are a few verses that I'll lay down for you. Michelle Obama, unafraid and unabashed to wear her crown of history, yet her crown seems a mystery to systems unsure of her hair. A wig, a buffon, a toupee, maybe not. Are there no words for our braids and our locks? The sunny skin and relaxed hair make Oprah the first lady. Even for her face well known, some algorithms fault her, echoing sentiments that strong women are men. We laugh, celebrating the successes of our sisters with Serena smiles. No label is worthy of our beauty. And so as I started testing out iconic images 
of women, I started seeing the labels we were being assigned. And since Hillary Clinton is in the room, when I would, try, when I would run images of women in pantsuit, it would say Secretary of State. <laughs> And the problem with the labels that AI systems produce is they actually govern access to what I call freedom money love. When you have algorithms determining who gets fired, who gets hired, who you get connected with as well, which is why I started the Algorithmic Justice League and I'm so honored to be part of the film Coded Bias. We just had our world premiere yesterday. Shalini Catania, the director is here, if you'll please stand up. And that work is absolutely amazing. So as we move towards an AI future, I hope you'll join the Algorithmic Justice League in moving towards more equitable and accountable AI with an intersectional lens. Thank you. So how do I introduce Gloria Steinem? <laughs> all you have to do is say her name, and instantly we all feel who she is and what she's done and meant in our lives, wherever we are on our life's journey. Gloria's work, her writing, her activism, her passion, her politics, and even her unique way of framing the truths that some may hold self-evident but Gloria articulated in a word that said, uh, in one of her famous phrases, first the, truth will piss, will, first the truth will set you free and then it will piss you off. Now you know why Gloria says it and not me. <laughs> if Gloria imagined a world, which she does every day, it is a world that is brilliantly defined and told. Her story in this year's festival selection the Glorias, an extraordinary film directed by the awesomely talented Julie Taymor, who I hope is here so that we can recognize, please Julie, stand and accept our thanks. There's really no way you can tell Gloria's story in one film because she continues to live her story. We, that's Gloria Steinem getting arrested uh, just last month, along with Jane Fonda and 140 others, including myself and my 21-year-old granddaughter. We were at the recent Fire Drill Friday, a movement that Jane Fonda launched to bring the world's attention to the climate emergency. That is Gloria. As long as there is an injustice, there will be Gloria, fighting for and defining the future that embraces and actualizes true equality for all women. Now, joining Gloria today in conversation, and this is someone who motivates us, I follow her, her writings I honor, Aisha Harris. She's the op-ed editor and writer of the New York Times. Aisha and Gloria, join us now on stage. The trouble with being introduced like that is you have to follow yourself. It's not possible. <laughs> Well, thank you so much to the women at Sundance for having me, and thank you, Gloria, for sharing the stage with me. It is an honor to be here. Um, so the Glorias, I saw it. I love the way in which Julie Tamor has made not a straightforward biopic. It is very um, imaginative and creative, and there's four different Glorias being played throughout different parts of your life. And it's a story that I think, you know, obviously you've written books, you've written about your, your life, but seeing, on, seeing it on the screen, it's a whole, it's gonna open it up to even more women and young girls to inspire. So I'm curious, what is it like for you to see yourself portrayed in this way? Well, first of all, I wanna say the book was mine, but the movie is Julie Taymor's. I mean, <laughs> I had no idea, I mean, the, the book, covers 80 years by doing chapters and leaving spaces and so on. How do you do that on screen? She invented this magical device of a bus through time 
It's, you know, you have to see it. It's completely miraculous. So, <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I, I kind of can't realize it fully, um, but I have faith in each of us telling our stories in whatever way we can, because that is the way we discover we're not alone, someone else had the same experience, uh, it's the, our version of sitting in a circle around a campfire, which we've been doing since time immemorial. Uh, and I think we truly, truly miss that now in a time in which people are looking at screens. And I have to say, as much as I love books, looking at a page, too, right? Because you, you don't produce the famous oxytocin that allows you to empathize on a screen or on a page. We have to be together with all five senses. So what you are doing here as filmmakers, what Julie did with my book, that brings us together to watch it, is the current campfire. And without it, we can't empathize with each other. So, you know, go forth and do it a lot more. <laughs> One of the things that I think makes your story so um, inspiring is the fact that you have always acknowledged the, women, the other women who have inspired you, especially the women of color who have inspired you. Uh, there's a moment in the movie where your character says, you know, there would be a movement without me. And I think that was just so powerful. And it was really great, personally, to see Dorothy Pittman Hughes, Flo Kennedy, Dolores Huerta, uh, Wilma Mankiller being portrayed we in couldn't, the film. Shirley Chisholm should have been, I mean, you know, right. <laughs> but we see all of them come in and out of your life within the movie, and, and I think it's really great to see that. And can you talk a little bit about sort of how you view the way in which the feminist movement has been portrayed in film and TV in the past? Yeah, it's a great sorrow to me that I see online words like white feminism. Okay, if it's white feminism, it is not feminism. And <laughs> I, I, I hope we stop saying that, okay? Or at least put it in quotes or right? something. Uh, because even statistically, <laughs> now Julie's saying, laughing because I love statistics, but anyway, that, <laughs> that uh, from the beginning of the movement uh, in the early 70s when the first Lewis Harris poll was published and the word then was women's liberation and the issues were all listed of reproductive freedom and so on. And it was 60 some percent of women of color who agreed and only 30 some percent of women, or anyway, it was definitely almost twice as many women of color who agreed. And, you know, look at the last election, you know, when 51% of white women voted for Donald Trump, it's like voting, you know, for your husband's interest, but not yours, because you're eviscerated of your identity, basically. And, <laughs> uh, yeah, because... <laughs> and 96% of, uh, of black women voted for the great Hillary Clinton. <laughs> so it has ever, ever, ever been thus. And I am going crazy. <laughs> with that. You know, I'm so glad to see that you're on the New York Times and you can fix this, okay, right? <laughs> I'm trying, we're trying. <laughs> okay. <sighs> because I just came from a retreat with uh, Paula Giddings, you know, the great Paula Giddings who wrote about Ida B. Wells and Beverly Guy Sheptel and so on. Okay, we're. We're working on a book, which we hope we finish, which we're trying to do the hidden figures, you might say, of, of the women's movement from the, in the 70s and 80s to try to rectify this. But we shouldn't have to be going back in our own current history doing this. So please, please, when you're writing history, when you're writing current events now, just try to make it look like the country because actually the movement is disproportionately women of color and always has been. Uh, 
you, you mentioned Hidden Figures, and I think of that movie. Um, I think of other TV shows and, and, and things on screen. Good Girls Revolt, which uh, Lydia Povich's book, which was turned into a sadly short-lived Amazon series. Um, but when we, I think what we're seeing is, is a lot more presently, more attempts to be inclusive within our retelling of the past. Um, do you feel that way as well? Do you feel as though we are kind of catching up? Like, obviously, we're making up for the things that have been left out, but are we kind of moving forward in that way? It, it, no, I, I think we are trying to catch up, but it's sort of insane that we have to go back and co correct history. I mean, hello, you know, it's supposed to be written right. And, and if, if, if newspapers are the first draft of history, then newspapers in the past, without you, were the you know, part of the problem. I mean, the Times is also doing, we have an overlooked series where we bring, uh, especially, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> we look back at the people who have passed, uh, who did not get an obituary. Um, women, people of color, all of these That's figures. That's great. And it's great that we're doing that, but, you know, we also, as, as you mentioned, we are still kind of in this place at this moment where we are having these conversations about white feminism and people being left out, even in the conversations happening currently right now. Um, so I think it's great that we have these things, but I agree with you that we do need to do better. No, it says, you know, in the museum, what's the Museum of the American Indian in Washington, where some of you have been, and I hope all of you go, everything is a circle in there. You always know that that's better than a straight line and, you know, okay. Anyway, <laughs> uh, it, 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 the, the historian who's on film there is saying there are two things, history and the past, and they are not the same. It's political. Who is history and who is not? Speaking of circles, there's another moment in the film towards the end where your character, I can't remember which version because they're all they're all on the same bus together. Again, this is a very interesting movie. You should go see it. Um, but, you know, we come upon the present day in the election 2016, and your character says, you know, I thought we already passed that sign that we just passed. Like, we're going in circles. And it, it's so easy right now to get dispirited about where we are when we read the news, when we, uh, when we interact with other people. You know, what do you hope for the future in terms of women, especially women coming together. We talk a lot about intersectionality, and you talk, one of the things you say is like, I just listen. But beyond just listening, what do, especially white women, but like what do we all need to do to go forward and really envision a future that includes everyone, women, non-binary, genderqueer, everything? Like, what do you think we should be doing? Well, one thing I think is helpful for white folks is to realize that it's in our self-interest. You know, you do not learn while you are talking. <laughs> you learn while you're listening, right? All right. You do not learn from sameness. You learn from difference. The world is, what, 10% white tops? Do you want to be in a white ghetto? All right. So I worry a little about, it, but about the language because the idea is even inclusive. I mean, it's a great word. I'm not saying don't, you know, but it's a little bit like one group has the power to include the other instead of understanding that the whole idea is we get to coalesce and look at the world as it really is. And I think some of the words are guilt-producing in white folks as opposed to be being like envy producing. Oh, <laughs> you know, I want to go there. I don't want to live in a secret. I don't want to live in a white ghetto. Uh, and I, we all need help, I think, in inventing language that makes it a reward. You know, we don't respond as human beings to the negative as well as we do to the positive, to what it is that we have to gain. And the more positively we can put it, I think the more real it is and the more real it will become. My final question for you, I think we're kind of in this moment, especially post-election, post-Me Too, where we are seeing um, all of these different 
uh, cultural products that are being aimed for uh, to uh, to represent women, um, and you know we have a Phyllis Schlaf. I always pronounce her name incorrectly. Phyllis Schlafly. Uh, <laughs> there's a docu or mini series coming out soon about her. There's a play right about Flo Kennedy that I think is in the works. I or? hope so. Yes. Th yes. There is. It's been written, and I hope it. It's been produced, and I hope it comes to New York. Right. So we're forgetting all of these things, and I, I, I just. I wonder, you know, going forward, envisioning what the feminist movement will look like on screen in the future, what do you um, think is the most important thing that can be conveyed in all of these different products, whether it's about someone like Phyllis Schlafly or if it's about someone like... Well, I don't know. Has anybody here seen uh, Mrs. America or any part of it? Anybody? Okay, because I don't know because I'm in it, but they definitely didn't ask me about it. So, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I fear, uh, and I don't know, I fear that it, it gives the idea that Phyllis Schlafly defeated the Equal Rights Amendment, when in fact it was the insurance industry, state by state, that defeated the Equal Rights Amendment because they didn't want to equalize their actuarial tables, it would have cost them a fortune. Right. So, is that in there? I don't know. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll, we'll find out. Um, but I, I, I just think it's looking at the real thing as opposed to the pretend thing. Does that make sense? Or doing our best to do that. And to listen to all the voices, not just some of the voices. Well, thank you so much for your time. It was lovely. So what we can do is keep reading what Aisha writes and listening to everything Gloria says and writes and stop talking and learning, right? Our next guest, I uh, feel like, teaches me something in everything she does. And here at the festival, you'll find her on the big screen again, opposite Tessa Thompson. And the jazz film, Sylvie's Love, please welcome Ava Longoria. Oh my gosh, good morning. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Yes. Y'all, this is my first Sundance, and I, uh, Carrie, you were, I mean, you were terrified. I'm terrified. I'm in between Gloria Steinem and Hillary Clinton. <laughs> what happened? This is crazy. Uh, I'm excited um, to be in, in this room with so many creative minds, creative female minds, and um, it's been quite a ride. If y'all haven't gone to the Latinx house, I recommend that you do. It's the first time that Latinos have had a presence um, in, in, a, a la, in a house, in a space. And so um, it has a beautiful library of uh, Latino authors, Latinx authors. It has wonderful art and amazing panels. So, so go and check it out. Um, they told me that the theme or topic today was Imagine Futures. If I could speak a little bit about that. And I was like, of course, I'm a, I'm a woman and a person of color. I'm a Latina. I have thought about that so many times. <laughs> Imagine a different future. And I remember probably my earliest memory of wishing something was different when, when I, was in the, I was in the third grade and my mom made me take uh, the gifted and talented test to get into a better school. And I was so mad because all that meant was me leaving my, my friends and going across town to a place I didn't know with people I didn't know. And I remember she made my usual breakfast in the morning, which was a bean taco, <laughs> which is what you eat in Texas as a Mexican-American, as a ninth generation Mexican-American. And I went to the bus stop and I remember getting on the bus and as I walked up, Everybody turned to stare at me, at yeah, my bean taco. And I was staring at them, and they were, it was just a sea of blonde, and they were all eating the same thing. And I had never seen it. 
and it looked really delicious, and it, it, was, it was a tart <laughs> that popped. Uh, even the name was magical, it was a Pop-Tart. And I sat next to one of the blondes, and, uh, and I was so excited, and, and I was like, what is that? And she said, what's that? And I remember somebody on the bus whispering, she's Mexican. And it was a fact that apparently explained me, and I didn't know what the word meant, but I knew it wasn't good <laughs> in this bus. And so I remember I went home and I was crying and I begged my mom to buy Pop-Tarts. Um, <laughs> she was like, no. Um, <laughs> I was like, please, I just want to be like them. I just want to look like them. I wanted to straighten my hair. I wanted to lighten. I put sun in. I put lemon in my hair so it would be a little lighter. And um, my mom, the next day, the next week for school, you know what she made me for breakfast? Two bean tacos. <laughs> and she said, don't ever shy away from your culture and never forget where you came from. <laughs> and, And it's, it was in this moment, I'm, and, and only, you know, when you're older, you get to reflect on these moments. And I, looking back, I asked myself, why did I want to be like those little girls? Why didn't they all dream of being like me? Looking like me, eating what I ate. So then I imagined a future differently. Because I thought, well, for one, I'm sure none of them ever saw a beloved Latino family on television or film. So imagine if those little girls had seen nothing but Latino families in film and television. Wouldn't that have become their norm? Their aspiration? Wouldn't they be ashamed of their Pop-Tart and want my bean taco? <laughs> it's an imagined future. And things really haven't changed in the last decades that I've been in school. <laughs> okay, many decades, but... Um, the Annenberg study, I don't know if you guys uh, saw this, it came out a couple months ago about Latins, uh, Latinx being erased from television and film. And uh, it was a couple months ago that despite we're 18% of the American population, we're only 4% in film. And that's a travesty because it's not only um, educating people about our community, but it educates us and our own community about who we are. There's an amazing activist and, and artist named Fabiana Rodriguez. I don't know if you guys, she's amazing. And she tells us that storytelling and narratives have to change culture before we can change policies. And she says that there is power in art and images and that that art and those images can absolutely transform what you believe. And that what we in this room put out there can change the minds of people. And when that happens, we can change those policies that affect people. Because I want you to ask yourself, does the fact that you rarely see Latinos in a beloved family in a film make it easier for you to look away when they're locked in cages? <laughs> and Latinos are under attack in this country. And I ask you not only to imagine a future that is inclusive, but let's go out and create it. Because this is the room where it happens. Let's make it be inclusive of all of us. And I want you to understand and accept that we do have the power here in this room. With all of your creative minds, we can change the way people see my Latino community, the way they see my brothers and sisters, the way they see me, and the way they will see my son. So I know we can do it because we all know if you want something done, ask a busy woman to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Are you getting the idea that there's a lot of power at the festival this year, and certainly with the power of story to change our lives? Well, when I imagined the future, I always had one very clear vision, and that was that there would be a woman president of the United States. And in a 
a fair and equal world, I would be now introducing you to the President of the United States. She led the way, and she continues to lead the way for an equal path to the White House and to every other leadership position where women's voices make a difference. Hillary Rodham Clinton epitomizes in an extraordinary life how one woman does change everything, and in doing so, changes everything from all of us. The former Secretary of State, First Lady, and an extraordinary friend. Hillary Rodham Clinton. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Wow. Um, thank you, Pat, and thanks to Carrie, everyone associated with Sundance. And I particularly want to recommend Pat's book, Becoming a Dangerous Woman, uh, because uh, she tells her story as well as other stories that uh, I think inspire and motivate. I am thrilled to be at Sundance. Now look, there, I, there's one other place I'd rather be, but I am thrilled, <laughs> thrilled to be at Sundance. And I, I am thrilled for two reasons. Uh, the first, because uh, I participated in this uh, series uh, named for me, called Hillary, uh, that will be starting on Hulu in March. Uh, it was directed by the absolutely amazing Nanette Burstein, who was uh, here, and I don't know if she still is, but I, um, I was interviewed for about 35 hours. And it is a you know, full look at my life. It started off about the campaign, and then Nanette made uh, the case that it needed to be much more than the campaign. It needed to be about my life, but not just the arc of my life, the arc of women's lives, uh, the changes that we've seen during the course of my life, uh, both in the women's movement and in politics. And I, I think she's done a terrific job. And I can say that because what I've learned at Sundance is that I am the talent. <laughs> and that, that means I didn't make it, you know? Everywhere I went for interviews over the last several days, uh, people would say to me, oh, you're the talent. And I thought that was kind of cool. So. I'm, I'm, I'm adding that to uh, my uh, resume. Now, the second reason, though, I'm really happy to be here is to participate in this uh, festival, and especially in this event, uh, because, as Ava just said, uh, culture comes first. There's a, a saying you might have heard that Culture eats policy and politics for breakfast, not bean tacos or Pop-Tarts. And that's because the culture drives how we think of ourselves, how we think of each other, how we imagine a future, not only personally, but collectively. And it won't surprise you to hear me say it, because we've heard it uh, from the other speakers, from Gloria and the others, that we are in the midst of quite a contentious cultural moment. And I was particularly taken by the uh, extraordinary description of what algorithms are doing to us. It's not bad enough that we have to figure out how to overcome you know, millennia of human nature and distrust and conflict. Now, we have to figure out how we are being manipulated on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, and how we are not only erased from society, as we saw with the facial recognition, but categorized and manipulated. So there is nothing more important 
than telling stories that not only lift up and describe the diverse, extraordinary lives that you all represent, but you also are introducing the rest of us to, but to recognize that what you are doing is so fundamentally political at this moment. Because when you turn to a screen, whether it be a TV or a phone or anything else, you don't see that loving Latino family. You see a caravan. And you're meant to see the caravan. And maybe when you turn on that screen, you don't see the kind of stories that are about a 40-year-old version. You see stories that are negative, that aren't uplifting, but down, down, down into fear and negativity. So having had a little experience with culture and politics in the <laughs> course of my life, I cannot stress enough how what you do, those of you in this room who are the creators and the makers and the innovators and the truth tellers and the talent, <laughs> we need you now more than ever. And the diversity that you represent is one of our strongest assets in trying to take back the story that we should be telling ourselves and our children and our grandchildren about not only who we are, but who we want to be in the future that we imagine. So thank you, and go out there and tell the truth. Thank you all.